got it. This is recording now. Before we get started with the study tonight, I do want to go over a few announcements before that. Uh, we have a couple of updates concerning our sick. David mentioned this morning, Linda Howell and Judy Beckwith, both homesick. Linda's recovering from bronchitis. Uh, Joanne Crook still having some difficulty with her shoulder and probably going to have to have surgery on that uh, in the future. Eileen Scoma is recuperating from a broken kneecap and Suzanne Davidson, Dusty Heaton's mother, is still in ICU in Jacksonville, Florida. I understand Lily Walker is a little better. She's in hospice right now and Kathy Harris's friend Lisa has been uh, diagnosed with breast cancer, but she's also got the coronavirus, and so that's complicating things. Hmm. Mentioned this morning, Jessica Smith, our new sister in Christ from a couple of weeks ago, has uh, been involved in a, a little accident down in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She had taken the kids and gone down to Hattiesburg to visit some family, and I believe it was Friday night, there was an accident involving a tractor, and she has a, a sprained shoulder and wrenched back and badly injured hip. She is at home at, at, at her kinfolk's house, but she's liable to be on pain medication and uncomfortable for several days, to put it mildly. And we learned this afternoon that Charity Nash's mother, Linda Hall, has been taken to Piedmont Noonan Hospital today. She had knee surgery about a month or six weeks ago and now she has blood clots in both lungs. And if you've ever been through something like that, you know just how upsetting and, and terrifying that really can be, uh, how it affects your breathing. And so uh, do keep uh, Linda Hall in your prayers as well. Uh, as far as upcoming activities, the only thing I want to mention is the uh, blood drive coming up next month here at the church building. I believe that's the 13th of next month. Uh, from three to seven. And of course, if you have donated to Red Cross before, you're probably getting texts and emails from them now asking for blood because they, they need more. Uh, and they're having a shortage because of the current uh, virus situation. I don't know that it has necessarily increased demand, but it has certainly decreased donations. So they're very concerned about that. So let's do keep those folks and those, those issues in our minds for the next few days. And uh, let me invite you now to join me in prayer and we'll begin our worship together. <clears throat> Lord God, our Father, we're grateful to you. And we thank you for your kindness, for the generosity and the goodness that you pour out upon us day after day. Father, we're thankful to you that you've given us a good day the opportunity to be together in this way, to communicate with each other, to be aware of each other and support each other in, in an hour of need. Father, we pray as always for our first responders, our medics, our paramedics, our doctors, nurses, our peace officers and firemen, and our military personnel as they're in harm's way in various, various aspects, various ways, whether it's from health or from violence. Father, we pray for their safety and we ask you to watch over them and bring them home to us in good health. Father, we pray for our nation, for our leadership, that our leaders would make wise decisions and choices that would, would get us back into a, a healthy place and back on track as a people. We pray especially for Jim and Tom and Jim and Greg as they are the shepherds, the pastors of the congregation here, and we ask you to watch over them, help them to be wise in all that they do so that we might be faithful and grow and walk in the light with you. This is church. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. We pray for our sick ones and ask your mercy for them, for their families, Father, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, let me invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to John chapter 16. No! John chapter 16. Hold on. And I'm going to Good begin Bible. reading at verse 16. And read down to the end of the chapter. It's about 15 verses. The New King James Version says, A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Now, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. And then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, in a little while, 
and you will see me, and because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he is saying. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, just realized the sound may not be up on this. Hey, Dave. Yes, Benny. Could you ask everyone to mute their microphones, please? All right. Ooh. Folks, if you if you don't have your microphone muted, please mute your microphone so that we don't get that background noise. Thank you. Now, let me get back to John chapter 16. They said, therefore, verse 18, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he's saying. Now, Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said a little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she's in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. These things I've spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray to the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, hold on to that passage and think about the things that we just read. And then reflect on the fact that in September of 1988, a musician by the name of Bobby McFerrin released the very first a cappella song to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, where it stayed for two weeks. The name of the song, some of you know, don't worry. Be happy. Maybe the only, uh, the only Bobby McFerrin song some of us can name. But McFerrin based his, his reggae jazz tune on the catchphrase of, a, of an Indian teacher, an Indian mystic named Meher Baba, who often referred uh, or responded to his followers' questions and to, to matters that upset them with those words Don't worry, be happy. Now, Rudyard Kipling an English author, wrote a poem. He's better known perhaps for the Jungle Book than anything else, but he wrote a poem that's often quoted that's called If, and it begins with the words, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, and then he goes on for several more verses and ends up saying, You'll be a man, my son. If you can do these things, then you'll be a man, my son. Well, let me ask a question. How many of us worry? 
certainly seems like we have plenty to worry about right now, doesn't it? Is it safe to touch that doorknob? Is it safe to, to go out of my house? I, I was just amused as I could be to see folks out in public on a, on a walking trail, out in the open air, wearing gloves and masks out in the open air. They weren't near anybody else, but it's, it's like they're worried that the very air they breathe is going to contaminate them. If, if, if I cough and sneeze, is it just allergies this time? You know, everything outside is painted yellow right now, isn't it? Is it just allergies or is it coronavirus? What if the stock market doesn't recover? Uh, will I have a job to go back to when this is all over? Think about the things that you worry about and answer this question. How many of those worries are realistic? How many of those worries are reasonable? How many of the things that you actually spend time and energy being stressed about are actually likely to happen? See, there's a, there's a big, big difference between things that could happen, things that we could imagine happening, and things that will happen. But in the meantime, what did the Savior say about that kind of stress? Go back to Matthew chapter 6. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble, Matthew 6 verse 34. Now, remember what we read a moment ago at the end of John 16? Jesus said, be of good cheer. Why? Because he's in charge. Now, worry, maybe it seems like uh, we've talked about this before, and we have, but maybe never quite in this situation. Worry is an expression of doubt. Think about that. Worry is an expression of doubt which is why it shows a lack of trust in God. In John 16, Jesus did tell the disciples, we will have some difficult times. And this seems to be one of them. He, he was foretelling, in the context, he was foretelling the time that, that he would return to the Father and the apostles would not have him right there with them. But remember what he said in Matthew 28, verse 20? As he gave the great commission, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. What did he say at the end? And lo, behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, to the end of the age. He's always with us. The disciples, though, when Jesus said these things to them in John 16, they were stressed because they didn't understand what he meant in verse 16, when he said, a little while and you'll not see me, and again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. In the context, he's saying, I'm going to not be seen. I'm going to be crucified. I'll be in the grave. You won't see me, but then you will see me because I'm not going to stay there. I'm going to rise once more. You will see me, and then you'll see me at the Father's right hand, ultimately, in eternity. Even after Jesus explained his words in verse 28, they didn't fully understand because what happens later on when they're actually in the garden? They're caught flat-footed. They're caught by surprise when he, by surprise when he's betrayed and tried and crucified and put in the tomb. It's only after he rises again that they finally begin to understand fully what he was talking about. Now, our world is, is filled with things that challenge our faith and our trust in God if we let them. In John 16, Jesus had just told the disciples that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all the truth. Verse 13, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he shall guide you into all the truth and, and cause you to know all things. They would feel like, though, when Jesus 
was crucified and buried. And then even after he arose, when he ascended to the father, they would feel like they're losing Jesus. But he said they'd be gaining understanding of what the father was doing for all of us to save us for all eternity. You know, Jesus never once said to his disciples, just trust me, just trust me. He always provides evidence for us, reasons for us to believe what he says. He never says, just believe me because I said it. He says, here's why. Here's proof. Here's evidence. Here's a reason to believe. Now, our world says, you know, the idea of life after life, that's just a fantasy. But the Bible says Jesus' tomb is empty. We have hope because Jesus is not in a grave. The Bible says he died, he was crucified, he died, he was buried. But he didn't stay dead. In fact, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, it was not possible for death to hold him. And so the one thing that that causes fear, that causes terror in our world, in all of human history, Jesus has overcome. Our world says, you know, we're just, we're just accidents that resulted from billions of years of evolution, the, the random combination of chemicals and electrical charges and temperature and everything just happened at the right time. And, and, and so really, we're no more important than a frog in the pond. We're just an accident. But you know, the Bible says that we're actually the highest point of everything that God created. In Genesis chapter 1, we read in verses 27 and 28, or 26 and 27, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And everything in our universe is made for our benefit. That's what verse 28 tells us. He put man in the garden and said, take care of it, subdue it, use these things. I made them for you. How we cope with challenges, with difficulties here, shows whether or not we accept the evidence for faith that God has provided for us. So Jesus tells his disciples, we will have some difficult times but that's not the defining feature of our existence here. Real worry. What was it that we, sang, we, we, we mentioned in that song, don't worry, be happy? There are things we should pay attention to and plan for, but real worry is obsessing over unrealistic situations, uncontrollable scenarios where we don't have any control. That means on a practical level that buying car insurance or buying home or homeowner's insurance or or even buying health insurance, that's not an expression of worry. That's an expression of recognizing there's a realistic scenario. This is, this is a possibility. Somebody might run into me. I might be distracted and run into somebody in my car, so I need insurance for that. My house might be struck by lightning or a tree might fall on it, so I have insurance to take care of that. I might get sick, or I might have some kind of an accident and get hurt. So health insurance takes care of some of that. Real worry is obsessing about unrealistic or, or uncontrollable scenarios. And what that means is that having enough groceries in the house to feed your family for a week is not a demonstration of lack of faith in God. It's just a practical thing because you might decide, you know what I was going to have for dinner tonight, I'm going to put that off, and save it for tomorrow night, and we'll just snack tonight. And if you've got stuff to snack on, you're well provided for. What it means is that carrying an umbrella on a cloudy day might be a good idea. But real worry takes what God has said about something. And remember, God tells us when he says believe, he says, here's why. Real worry takes what God has said about something and argues. It says, yes, I know, Lord, but no matter what he said regardless of what he says. It, it's like saying, well, I know you said that, that we can have eternal life, and I know that Jesus is not in the tomb, but there's no but there. Jesus is not in the tomb. Jesus never said that Christians would be able to just skate through this world without a care or a problem 
or, or any kind of difficulty. In fact, think about it. He actually said pretty much the opposite, didn't he? Look at the beginning of John 16, verse 33. He said, uh, you may have peace, but then he said, in the world you have tribulation. You have difficulties. Over in Luke chapter 22, in verse 35, just before he went with his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked the apostles, when I sent you out, he's talking about when he sent them out on the limited commission, when I sent you without money bag or knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, nothing. They didn't lack for anything. Jesus sent them out to the house of Israel, and he said, don't take any extra stuff. Wherever you go, expect the folks to provide for you. Expect me to take care of you. And guess what? They went and God provided. He never said that we would have no problems, no difficulties at all. What he said is that he would equip us, he would provide for us so that we can handle all of those problems, all of those difficulties with his help. In fact, the Hebrews writer tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 that our high priest is there, Jesus is there at the Father's right hand so that we can go to him in times of trouble and ask for grace to help us in times of need and expect to find it. Now, worry, doubt, these are things that are resolved by faith. And that's the point that Jesus was actually making in John 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Back up. What was that that Jesus said? We can have peace. And that word peace means tranquility, security, safety, happiness. Did you know that there are 85 verses in the New Testament in the King James Version and 87 references there to things that are in Christ? Most of the time it's uh, in Christ we have redemption, in Christ we have blessings, in Christ we have uh, forgiveness, uh, we need to be in Christ, things like that. But included in those is peace. We have peace in Christ, according to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 14. That's what he's praying for. It's just one of the blessings the Father offers us. You know, that would actually make a really good personal Bible study to just take your computer concordance or, or your Bible and go through and search out all those passages that talk about what's in Christ. I think you'd be amazed at everything that's in Christ. Of course, the other side of that coin is, if I'm not in Christ, if I'm not walking with him faithfully, if I'm not being a, a faithful Christian, practicing my faith, I'm not going to have all of those things, those blessings, those good things, that hope, that forgiveness, redemption, that prospect of eternity. And I'm not going to have peace without being in Christ and having him in my life. But go on in John 16 and verse 33 for just a minute. He says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. That expression, be of good cheer, that's actually a commandment. Did you ever think about that? That's a commandment from the Lord. It doesn't, it, it doesn't say just, just be constantly happy and, and, and constantly upbeat no matter what, but rather, it's an instruction about how Christians cope with the challenges, the tribulations that we encounter in this life. We recognize they're not permanent. They're only temporary. They're not things that can take away our hope. They're just things that can distract us if we let them. Be of good cheer. That instruction means have courage. Be comforted, and it's the opposite of being troubled and, and suffering, having tribulation. When we're confronted by worry, that's our faith being challenged. 
and it's an opportunity to rise to the occasion. I am really glad and, and gratified and encouraged in, in this time of, of being a little discombobulated, a little bit upset. You know, Luann is working from our bedroom. She's got a, a computer screen set up on the desk in our bedroom, and she spends her, her work day there, looking out the window and doing her work on the computer. And, and that's a little, a little out of the ordinary for most people. But I'm really encouraged that our faith being tested is not being broken. We deal with the setbacks. We deal with the difficulties. But because we have faith in Christ, we go on. And those things are just minor details on the road of life. Several months ago, Gail Pelfrey, one of our brothers here at Fayetteville, said something. He made a profound observation. I don't know if he realized just how profound it was when he said it. But he said, when we have faith, we can walk on water. When we have faith, we can walk on water. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying go out and, and try to walk across the surface of the swimming pool. But rather, when we have faith, when we're with God, God is with us. And we need to recognize that. We need to remember that, take that into account and appreciate that. This is the challenge that the Lord provides for us, to pass the test of faith by not doubting him, not getting upset and giving up our faith just because we've encountered a little moment of trial. We can get through this too. After all, Jesus got through the cross for us. And God has provided everything we need for life and godliness, every spiritual blessing that's in Christ. There's another one of those things in Christ, by the way, every spiritual blessing. God has provided us every reason to have faith, to be strong, to look forward. After all, what we have in this world, the things that we worry about, that we stress about, everything in this world is temporary. I like what Brother Marshall Keeble said one time years ago to a brother who was very proud of everything that he had accumulated in this world. Brother Keeble said, the Lord's going to burn it all up. See, this world is not home for Christians. This world is just the, the, the waiting place for our real home, which is with God in eternity. God says, don't doubt me. But he doesn't say, just trust me. He says, here's why. Our faith is challenged, but we have no reason to, to be shaken, to give up hope. We have every reason to be confident because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Well, that's a good place to stop this line of thoughts. I could, I could go on indefinitely. But thank you for being here. Thank you for participating. Let me ask you to, to join with me in prayer again, and let's remember our folks that are sick and our folks that are homebound and check on them and look after them. And let's look forward to the time that we can be back together, not in this way, but face to face and not having to worry about keeping a distance from each other because of the COVID-19 bug, but when we can be together in the presence of the Lord in this world and ultimately in the presence of our Father in eternity. Let's pray together. Lord God and merciful Father, we're grateful to you. We thank you for letting us have this time and letting us live in this time when we can be together even digitally, if not in person. Again, our Father, we pray for our sick ones to recover. We pray for our folks who are in harm's way, that you would protect them and keep them healthy and well. We pray for ourselves that you'd help us to be wise and careful, but not worried, not overcome with fear or doubt, but confident because we're your children and our Father controls the world. Father, we thank you for all the good things that you give us. We thank you for the, the care that you take for us, the, the things that you provide. We thank you for loving us 
especially we thank you for forgiving us, forgiving your son so that we can be forgiven. We ask you to watch over us, to keep us safe. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here, folks. Look forward to seeing you again. We will have uh, a Tuesday morning Bible class. It, it would normally be our men's Bible class, but ladies, you're welcome to, to sit in as well. We'll use this same Zoom link, this same Wednesday Live link on our webpage for that 10 o'clock Tuesday morning. And we'll be studying from the Word of God then and 7 o'clock Wednesday night until the governor says we can get back together in person. Thank you for being here. God bless all of you. Have a good evening.